Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Attorney General Tom Horn responds to allegations that he broke election and campaign laws. And we'll hear how nuclear testing in the 1950s and 60s is still impacting northern Arizona residents. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Attorney General Tom Horn yesterday sent letters to state elections officials denying allegations that he used state personnel and resources for campaign purposes. Here now to address those allegations is Arizona Attorney General Tom Horn. Good to see you again. Thanks Always for joining good to be us. With you. Um, all right, let's, let's get to the claim. Sarah Beatty, ex-employee, mm -hmm. claim. Executive staff worked on your campaign, your re-election campaign, on state time. Majority of the campaign work was done during regular hours. Your response? Not true. I filed um, 11 uh, statements by witnesses that contradict her. Uh, two statements by former employers that where when she leaves employment, she turns on them. Um, same circumstances as this case. Uh, the, everybody had to work eight hours a day. They signed statements uh, giving their hours every two weeks where they said, I understand I can be prosecuted if I'm not telling the truth. Uh, the, and, and you know, one of the things that the witness statements showed was that there was a, there was a meeting offsite where she actually started crying, complaining that, uh, they were, that the chief of staff was watching her time to be sure she put in her eight hours. And, um, uh, and the chief of staff said, we all have to put in our eight hours and volunteering for the campaign after work is voluntary. Um, so it's not, it doesn't seem likely to me that 13 people are not telling the truth. She says that she was hired specifically to fundraise for your campaign. She immediately began campaign work upon being hired uh, under the direction of Kathleen Wynn, I think your outreach, mm -hmm. uh, uh, community outreach person there and involved with something else that we'll maybe touch on later. Mm -hmm. But again, when she says she's hired specifically to do this and that's what she did, is she lying? Um, yes, that's, that isn't true. There's a statement from Kathleen saying that the, the meeting was all about Kathleen needed an administrative assistant. It was a low-level position, a $32,000 administrative assistant position. Um, and uh, she had worked as an uh, administrative assistant before. Uh, Kathleen says in that meeting, they talked about what she needed, the help she needed. The only one who ever brought up politics in that meeting was, uh, was Sarah Beatty, not, not Kathleen or Bert or Brett Meekham, who was also present. And when she brought up politics, yeah. how, how was it responded? How, what was, what, was she told you're not supposed to do that? Was she advised what the law is? Well, no, she, she is allowed. She has a First Amendment right to volunteer for a campaign if she wants to, but she has to do it on her own time. Right. She can't do it on state time. She, but she says she worked two hours a day in official duties, and well, the rest was on campaign. Okay, work. well, we know that's not true. First of all, her immediate supervisor says if you look at what the work she did, responding to constituent letters, uh, working on the police officer's memorial board, um, uh, doing legislative work. It's just not, that's just not possible. Secondly, she herself signed timesheets saying that she worked eight hours uh, and, and, the, and she had to acknowledge every time she signed the timesheet time that if she wasn't telling the truth, she could be prosecuted for it. And, and one other thing, we know it's not true because when she didn't work eight hours, her pay was docked. And in, on my statement, I, I showed records showing many, many times where substantial numbers of hours her pay was docked because she didn't work 40 hours on state work. And, and yet she was hired, and, and she says for campaign purposes, you say no, no. Uh, but she was hired, she went from $32,000 to mm -hmm. $35,000 a mm -hmm. year to a $10,000 bump to $45,000 mm -hmm. a year. If she was having such trouble filling out time cards and being an apparent problem, why the increase in pay? Well, she started out working constituent services, and that's an uh, um, uh, element, you know, uh, entry-level job uh, with a very low salary. She moved to constituent services and did work, the kind of work I mentioned, responding to constituents, working on police officers, memorial board, uh, legislative work, more responsible job, uh, carried a higher salary. And she personally told me that she couldn't make it on what she was making. And sh she had gotten to know me because she was volunteering uh, for the campaign, and, and I thought, well, I can understand that she can't make it on $32,000. And yet, though, I mean, it, it seems like someone who is that kind of a problem, do you really want that person, A, in the office, and B, getting a raise? Well, sometimes um, somebody doesn't work out in one part of the office. My philosophy is give, give them a try someplace else. Sometimes people succeed in one place 
and not in the other. And I always, this is my management style. I've always given people a chance that way. Her claim is that you met with staff during the day to discuss the campaign and we're not talking lunch hours, we're not talking lunch breaks, that this was a major part of the day. Your response? Not true. And um, I have a witness statement from the executive director of the trade association that was three blocks away who said that we came there many times during lunch and after work to have our meetings about the campaign. If we were running the campaign from the office, as she alleges, there would have been no need for us to go there. Well, is, is that your election campaign headquarters there? And if so, it, it seems like it's not much of a headquarters, to be quite honest with you. Other folks seem to have, you know, all sorts of things going on at their headquarters. Yeah. The, the claim from her is that your attorney general's office is your headquarters. Uh, no. First of all, uh, whatever needed to be done as far as meetings and deciding what people would do and so on was done at this trade association. And as I say, I've got an independent statement from the executive director there that we were there many times at lunchtime and after work doing those things. Um, I, I noticed uh, in, in the Tom Ryan interview, he said mm -hmm. these other headquarters are a beehive of activity. Yes. Well, that's not true at this time. I, I, uh, I walk by the Rodolini headquarters because it's, it's near a subway and I like their sandwiches. They have a lot of vegetables, they're healthy. And I peer in, it's like a big cavernous uh, uh, ghost town most of the times so I look in there. At this point, as you get closer, then you start to have phone banks and you need a more busy headquarters. And, and, and we do now have a separate headquarters on Thomas Road. But uh, up until this point, the main things that you do in a campaign are you raise funds, which doesn't need a campaign headquarters. The candidate's the one that makes those calls. Mm -hmm. You have to get petition signatures. There's no way to get petition signatures during working hours. You do that at night and on weekends when, where people gather. And, um, and, and there's a, an email campaign, and I paid an outside firm $2,500 a month for emails. There, there would be nothing to have a beehive of activities for that far from the campaign. As you get closer, then you start having phone banks when people are paying attention, and we will have a headquarters for that. But this idea about beehive of activities, it was one of the sillier of the things that Tom Ryan made up. You mentioned fundraising. The claim, again, from Sarah Beatty, the mm -hmm. claim is that you frequently made fundraising calls from your office, and that you even had a campaign, a binder of campaign donors, mm -hmm. mislabeled Border Patrol, mm -hmm. in your office that you would use to call folks on state time. Right. I used that binder at, at the headquarters of the trade association three blocks away. And again, there's an independent statement from the executive director that I went there many times to make calls from that binder. If I was doing that, uh, you know, if I was w willing to make those calls from the office, why would I be going there to make the calls? We know I made the calls because we've got an independent witness saying I went three blocks away to make those calls. Yes, but did you make those calls from your office? I, n I never made systematic calls from the binder from my office. I, I sometimes called people that I knew personally uh, from my office on my cell phone, not on the state phone. But if I was systematically calling from the binder, it was always three blocks away at the trade union headquarters. And I've got an independent witness, the executive director, who said he, he saw me go there. And occasionally she came with me late in the afternoon. She, um, I cite an email. Sarah Beatty. Sarah Beatty. Uh, I cite a, a text that she said that she would work from 7 to 3. Incidentally, there's an, also a text from her confirming this event about the this crying fit that she had mm -hmm. where she where she says it's bs that Bargard watches my time so closely in in this other text message she says i can work from seven to three the implication being once she's put in her eight hours from seven to three then she, she has time to volunteer and and she did occasionally come with me at in late afternoon to those headquarters and sat with me as i made calls from that binder at this offsite location, not in our office. And yet she has a, about a couple dozen campaign-related emails exchanged by staffers that she says were exchanged during work hours. There's also metadata uh, in the complaint regarding Brett Meekham, who I think is your uh, legislative assistant, working 20 hours over two days on a campaign flyer. That's a lot of hours over two days. That sounds like some office work had to be taken there. Well, it's obviously impossible. You, you, you don't spend 20 hours editing. He can do that in a few minutes. A, a sixth grader could do it in a few minutes. The, if it's, the metadata shows 20 hours is because he left his computer on overnight. The mere fact that they allege that he worked 20 hours editing a, a, an invitation uh, just shows how lacking in credibility they are. That's, a, that's an absolutely absurd thought that he would spend 20 hours editing an invitation to a fundraising Well, it's a, they called it a campaign flyer. You call it an invitation. We it don't, was an invitation. Okay. Talking about. If, it's, it's, so, it's so patently ridiculous that the mere fact that they're willing to say that somebody spent 20 hours editing uh, an invitation um, shows that they, that they totally lack credibility. It, it, the, the obvious 
thing that happened is he left his computer on off overnight. If you, you were attorney general, okay, mm -hmm. you're yeah. law enforcement here. Yeah. If someone came to you, if I came to you uh, and someone accused me of something, I said, well, actually, I just left my computer on for mm -hmm. that amount of time. Would you buy that? Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely no question. There is no chance, there's zero chance that uh, Brett Meekham spent 20 hours editing an invitation. Uh, he wouldn't even spend 15 minutes. Uh, he could, he would, he could, it would take a few minutes for him to edit an invitation. The charge is patently absurd, and the fact that the charge was made shows how incredible they are. They also are suggesting that, it, it, let's get to the, the grand 30,000 foot view here. Mm -hmm. Do you think you were careless in running the office, having so many people involved in your campaign, so many quote unquote volunteers mm -hmm. involved in your campaign in the office and having to depend on work hours, lunch breaks, these sorts of things that you say they were on when they volunteered there. Is that a smart idea? Uh, well, I, I totally disagree with you. I think the fact that people are w working with me they see how I perform as Attorney General. They see me win my cases. They see me argue two cases to the U.S. Supreme Court and win them both. They see me argue to the Arizona Court of Appeals, Arizona, uh, Arizona Superior Court, Federal District Court, Ninth Circuit, U.S. Supreme Court. They see the work I'm doing and how I'm winning my cases and protecting Arizona from federal overreach. And if they choose to volunteer, that's, I think, a positive sign. And it's their First Amendment right to volunteer, but they have to do it on their own time. They have to put in eight hours a day, and this was absolutely emphasized, and it was emphasized to such an extent by the chief of staff that, uh, that Sarah Beatty herself was crying about it, that she wouldn't let her go early and you've, not put in her eight and hours. And you've mentioned that a number of times, yeah. and when we had Tom Ryan, her attorney on the program, yeah. he is saying that you are running a smear campaign against Sarah Beatty because you don't have the facts to back yourself up. No, How do you I, respond to that? I've, I've, give, I've given lots of facts. And but is it necessary to say she had a crime? Well, what, what is that? What is, it why tells you that? because it's exactly the opposite of what she's saying now, and and, and, there, and there are five witness statements to it. So, it's it is a demonstration of the fact. What was she crying about? Because the chief of staff was saying, "You have to work eight hours. You can't leave early to volunteer. We all have to work eight hours." Is what she said. This is in the witness statements. This isn't me. Um, and and volunteering is a is a voluntary activity. You don't have to volunteer after work if you don't want to, but you must put in eight hours. And she was very strict about that. And so because of all that, you think she has now come back, and you've also mentioned this whole story you think is a part of the liberal media. I believe oh, there's a campaign uh, flyer or some sort of a message out there, which I'm kind of curious about. Mm -hmm. But you think because of this, she has twi made all of these claims regarding all of these people doing all of these things. Again, is that a reasonable thing to suspect? Well, um, uh, this isn't the first time. She's, this is her pattern. She's only 26 years old, and, and we have statements from two prior employers that she turned on them when she left. The, 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 the assistant director of the McCain campaign said she made a claim for overtime that they figured was false. And um, I thought I turned this off. Yeah, I guess someone's trying to get you right now. <laughs> well, that's, I'm not going to ask about that. Uh, all right. And, 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 that she, uh, and that they thought it was false, but they paid her to avoid political embarrassment. She says that's not true. Now, why would the assi former assistant director of the, camp uh, the McCain campaign make something up? Same with uh, leaving the employee of a lobbyist and accusing him of trying to push religion on her. Well, the, the, Everybody, the, according, uh, if you believe her, you have to believe that 13 other people are lying. I, I find that hard to believe. Well, then why didn't, what kind of background work was done on her before you hired her? Well, I'll plead guilty on that. We, uh, we should have done more background work on her. We, we did have uh, recommendations on her. But there was a lot about her that we didn't know that I wish we had known. Bottom line, are you campaigning on the taxpayer's dime? Absolutely not. And I have filed a very detailed statement giving a lot of facts showing that it's not possible. Eleven witness statements, two former employers, they can't all be lying and, her, and she telling the truth. And I know that uh, there are critics of yours who say that all these folks, including now the Yavapai County attorney who sees problems, this is a separate case here, we don't have time to get into it deeply, but mm -hmm. again, she's not buying an administrative law judge's determination that there, there's a chance that you did not coordinate well, with you, the you independent know, You know, committee. you skipped over that very fast. I, yes, because I, I don't <laughs> have too much time. You know, I, I, was, I was pulverized in the liberal media with accusations that I had done a campaign, let, let me explain this, I had, that I had done, that I'd, uh, done a campaign finance violation pulverized of repeated headlines in the, in, the, in the Arizona Republic of the size you would expect if, if Japan bombed Pearl Harbor again. And it comes to an independent judge, the first person to view the evidence independently, and she rules that it's a false charge. 
And you know, if you read the Republic editorial page, you'd think I'd lost that case and not won it, but I won it. It was a false charge. You won that, that recommendation, yet the county attorney, Frieva Pai, she has nothing to gain by this, does she? Well, why, why would she continue to process this? She's the this? adversary. She, the, the, the contest was between her on one side and us on the other right. side, and she lost. And she doesn't want to lose, so she wants to overrule the empire. It's, it's as though, to give you an analogy, a base runner in baseball is called out at a base, and he says, I overruled the umpire. I was really safe. All right. Before, the, the independent judge, I, who's neutral, right. decides between two adversaries and say that it says that it's a false charge. But you know, paying attention to the liberal media, you would never believe it. Last question yeah. on that particular thing. Yeah. Again, you're attorney general. You're presented yeah. with a case in which someone calls someone else, and two minutes later, an ad campaign is changed. Someone calls someone else, two minutes later, script is changed. Someone calls someone else, immediately emails an ad campaign director, it's changed. Yeah. Someone sends an email chain to, uh, regarding the ad campaign, yeah. it's changed. Yeah. This is you and Kathleen Wynne here are the someone and the someone. Would yeah. you buy that all of that is coincidence? Well, you've picked out a little bit of evidence that the losing side put forward. The judge heard all the evidence, mm -hmm. all the surrounding circumstances, a lot of testimony, a lot of documentation, and the judge said it's a false charge. And I think the public is going to listen to the judge not the liberal media or, or the loser Sheila Polk, but the, the neutral judge who heard all the evidence and made a decision based on that evidence that is a false charge. And, and, and you know, somebody ought to teach the Republic editorial board that when a judge makes a decision, that is the decision. Uh, and, and they shouldn't treat it as though I lost a case that I won. Well, and the county attorney would probably need that message too, correct? Absolutely. Last question. Yeah. Are we part of the liberal media? You aren't. You're terrific. You're very fair. And oh. I always love coming on your program. Well, we're good, good to have you here. I'm glad you answered some questions. We'll get you back on to answer more, I'm sure. Good to see you. Thanks good for joining us. Good to see us. you. Thank you. downwinders, people affected by fallout from nuclear testing in southern Nevada during the 1950s and early 60s. It's an increasing concern among those who lived in northern Arizona at the time, including Sherry Hanna, whose husband John Hanna Jr. of Prescott died this past October of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Sherry Hanna joins us now to discuss the issue of downwinders in Arizona. Thank you so much for making the trip down here. It's nice to see you. Thank you. I know this is a very important topic to you. Again, downwinders are folks who lived downwind from nuclear testing, correct? Yes, from the test site in Nevada, the Nevada desert. The government determined because of the weather and the wind patterns that were uh, blowing during the time of the testing, they determined the areas that were affected. And those areas include what parts of northern Arizona? Um, the Arizona counties are uh, Gila County, Apache, Coconino, Navajo, Yavapai, and Mojave, a portion of, of Mojave County. And these are the years 1950s to what, early 60s? Yes, early 60s, 62. And then, uh, um, there's a window there of um, also from June 30th, 1962 until July 31st, 1962. What kind of cancers now are considered possibly impacted by this fallout? There are 20 cancers that fall under the Downwinder program. Uh, I can list them all, but if you go on the Department of Justice website, Downwinders, it'll list them for you. And uh, there are 20 of them that are classified as the Downwinders cancer. And talk about your husband. Yes. he was diagnosed uh, in April of 2012 of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We suspected it was a downwinder uh, cancer because my father passed away in 1983. He was also a downwinder and he passed away of esophageal cancer. And so that's when we became familiar with the Downwinders program. And as, as the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act of, of 1990, talk mm -hmm. to us about that and how that impacts those who feel they may have been affected. In 1990, Congress passed the uh, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, 
and to date it has paid over 1.8 billion dollars out in compensation for the downwinders and there are compensation for the downwinders people that were in the path of the radiation fallout it also encompasses um, on-site participants who worked at the mm -hmm. nuclear site uh, the uranium miners that work there and the ore transporters that also work there and they receive a different comp compensation than what the downwinders are. And survivors as well? Yes, uh, survivors can receive the compensation if the individual passed away from one of the cancers. Yes. You have to get one of the cancers How, to receive compensation. Do we know that the cancer rates for the downwinders are higher than those who may not have been in the path? They do know that and they also know that Mojave County which is closest to the Nevada test site has the highest uh, rate of uh, incident rate and mm -hmm. it was closest to the nuclear site or so, the test site. So when there are critics, and there are critics of everything out there, when they mm -hmm. are saying that the, you, you can't really know if a cancer has been caused by this, how, how do you respond to that? I think the government has done a really good job of categorizing the cancers that they've come across and the fact that they've paid out so much in compensation I think speaks for itself. And your job now is, what do you see your job as? Get the information out? Yes, because um, there's so many people that have never, that were actually raised in these areas and or had family members that were and have passed away. They've never heard of the program. They, mm -hmm. they don't know what the Downwinders is. And also, if you um, are a Downwinder, they, uh, the government has set up a free screening program. And you can go for free screenings, uh, cancer screenings, once a year. And uh, this kind of keeps you ahead of, of anything that might show up through the test. We've got about 15 seconds left. What's next for you? My goal is to just keep speaking out about it to let people know about the screening process so they can go and get checked. And um, early detection is your best protection. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we thank you for having it. me. Thank, thank you. you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.